Welcome everyone to our academic interview for faculty position in the US. This is an ESWN hosted event. Uh, my name is Karin Ardendreyer and we also have here uh, Remat. We're both co-chairing the event for ESWN and we're very happy that you can join us today. This event is part of a series of events that we've been creating, um, which uh, we had event uh, earlier this year to talk about the academic application. What do you need to do? How do you create your uh, package? And you can watch, if you were not able to attend it, you can watch it on YouTube. And we're very happy to have here today four amazing panelists who join us willingly to talk about their experience into the interview aspect. So you submitted your package, you got interview, what do you do now? Um, so we'll have a chance to to see and hear of the experience of these four amazing panelists. But what do you expect to have today? We're already part of our introduction and welcoming. Uh, we will hear from each one of our panelists uh, uh, about their experience and about their academic track. We will have a panel discussion based on question you sent us during the uh, registration. We will also have time for Q&A. And one of the most important thing for us would be the breakout room, which will you have a chance to interact with each one of the panelists. Uh, and we'll close the event. Now, uh, if you have any question or any issues, Remat is uh, registered as question at ESWN. So feel free to send her a direct message. Uh, in a second, Remat will put in the chat our ESWN code of contact. You all had to apply for it and say that you will uh, uh, basically be respectful. We want to hear everyone's opinion, but we want to be respectful for other people. All aspects of the event except the breakout room will be recorded. So if you had to leave, you still can see it on YouTube in a few days. Um, and the event is fully closed captioned. You will be muted for the duration of the event. As I mentioned earlier, if you have any question, if you don't want to put them in the chat during the event, if you want to stay disclosed, feel free to send them to question at ESWN. Now, feel free to share your thoughts, share your experience. And again, if you have any technical issues, feel free to, again, experience them to question at ESWN. Remat will be the one who will help you. If this is your first time in ESWN event, welcome. We're happy to have you here. ESWN is a nonprofit organization dedicated to increase diversity across the geoscience, empowering and creating supportive nutrient community uh, in a, a working of culture change to eliminate barriers and diverse scientific works. A workforce and also to empower scientific through professional development. Uh, if you are not a member of ESWN, please feel free to join because we have wonderful events that we're hosting uh, every month and uh, we're hoping you know you'll be able to join our community and also provide us with ideas for future event. So we're ready to go into our uh, uh, session. So we put just a one slide to tell you what to expect in general. Now you submitted your application and now there's a period of just waiting and waiting, waiting to hear back. If you heard back, that's a great sign. A lot of the time we never hear back from the university we apply to. But if you heard back, that means you're actually gonna be, uh, increase the chances of being invited for an interview. Some university, before inviting you on site, will have a phone or a Zoom call. That means you are in a short list. Um, and our panelists might be able to talk about that experience. Um, but after that, if you pass that short list, you are invited for an on-site interview. What should you expect? We're going to hear a lot about that. Depending on the institute, you will be expected to maybe teach a class similar to a class that taught at the university. You will be expected to give a seminar that will be more scientific to showcase your research work. And you're gonna meet a lot of people. You're gonna meet faculty, you're gonna meet staff, you're gonna meet students. Expect two to three, even four days of very, very busy schedule. We're gonna hear all about it from the personal experience of our panelists. Now, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. So we're going to get to hear all of them, but I want to take the chance now to introduce our panelists. 
And our first panelist uh, that we're going to hear from is going to be Courtney Hutch. So let me just introduce all our panelists and then we'll move to Courtney Hutch. Courtney Hutch is a professor of chemistry and natural science and the Dean of the Hendricks College. Um, after we're going to hear from Courtney, we're going to hear from Jessica Henskins, who's an assistant professor in Department of Atmospheric Science at University of Utah. We're going to hear from Rachel Bernard, who is an assistant professor in Department of Geology in Amaret College. And we're going to finish our introduction of the panelists with uh, Gia Staki de Qua, who is an assistant professor in EAPS at MIT. So Courtney, I'm going to stop, share my screen, and uh, let you introduce yourself. Well, hello, everybody. I first want to thank Karen and Eswin for inviting me here today. It's really nice to be a part of this community and to, to help give advice to other people who are out there um, looking for looking for academic positions. So um, I'm my name is Courtney Hatch. I uh, have a PhD in atmospheric chemistry. I did my PhD work at the University of Colorado under Maggie Tolbert and Brian Toon. Um, and uh, I did a postdoc with Vicki Grossian at the University of Iowa. Um, my experience with academic interviews is probably not similar to other people's. Uh, I went to Hendricks College as a student. Um, so I have history with the institution that I'm at now. And uh, at the time when I was in my postdoc position, I didn't really want to be in academia. I didn't realize that I wanted to be a professor. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do at the time. Uh, out of the blue, my academic advisor from college called me and said, hey, I'm retiring. You should apply for my job. And so I think that's the privilege of going to a small school and knowing the community that, that raised you. Um, and keeping in touch with your network, uh, I think that that was really helpful to me. And at the time, I was thinking, well, I don't necessarily want to be a professor unless it's at a school like Hendrix, um, where I would have those one-on-one -on -one interactions with students. I could have work with students together in the lab um, and have those close personal interactions with my students. Um, I like to see people grow and become who they're going to be. Um, so I applied. <laughs> I pulled together some application materials. I didn't talk to anybody about it. I didn't show any of my materials to anybody. I was not prepared. I had not planned on going on an interview. Um, and I ended up getting a phone interview. And then that was 16 years ago. So it was actually a phone interview and not a video interview. Um, and I got an offer to be invited to campus. Um, at that point, I knew that they were probably serious about potentially giving me the offer and um, uh, had no experience doing interviews at all. Um, I'll, I'll preface it with the fact that I was seven months pregnant at the time. So there was a lot of anxiety about going through a very intense interview for you know, two full days of meetings back to back and I get my uh, interview schedule and there are no bathroom breaks. <laughs> so um, uh, I hop on a flight, um, 15 minutes into my flight, the plane has mechanical issues that turn around. I didn't have a cell phone. I, did, I had no way of contacting anybody on the committee to say that I was gonna be running late. Um, and so it was all going very badly right from the beginning. Uh, and and um, I did end up getting on the next flight. I was three hours late. I borrowed someone's cell phone that was sitting next to me on the plane so I could at least send and send a message to them and let them know that I was going to be late. So uh, what turned out to be a bad start was actually kind of a social opening right? Um, uh, and, and a way to talk about my resourcefulness and my problem solving skills in the interview. So it was actually turned out to be a good thing. Uh, so th they were waiting for me for three hours at the airport until I arrived. Um, meanwhile, they're all rescheduling my entire interview to make up for the time that 
um, I, I was delayed. Um, so all of it kind of came together. And what I didn't realize was that the interview starts the second you meet someone off the plane. Um, they're going to pick you up from the airport and drive you and ask you questions along the way. And that's a part of the interview. And so I wasn't expecting that. Um, there were a lot of other unexpected things that happened during my interview, um, but it was long, intense, very few bathroom breaks, which I had to advocate for occasionally. Um, I didn't realize I was going to meet with the president and had a very philosophical conversation with the president of the college about climate change. And that was, I was not prepared for that. Um, so all all the while, I don't know what kinds of questions I'm supposed to be asking. In some cases, I didn't have questions to ask. And so I was very unprepared. Um, somehow, I got the job offer. Um, and uh, I've now been at Hendrix for 15 years, um, almost 16 years. And uh, I've uh, gone through the tenure and promotion process. I have um, chaired interdisciplinary program. Uh, I've been the depart chemistry department chair here at Hendrix. Um, I've been in elected faculty positions on uh, the council on academic policy. So the big decision-making uh, committee on academic um, issues. Uh, and most recently I've been elected to what we call the committee on faculty, which is the, um, uh, it's the committee that includes the provost and the associate provost and then the area chairs, which um, at any bigger school would probably be called a natural sciences dean, right? So they call it an area chair here. Um, and in my role as area chair, and this is my first year doing it, but uh, uh, I'm in charge of all the faculty um, evaluations that are in the natural science area. Um, I sit on all the hiring committees, including those outside of my area. So uh, I get to meet with every single candidate that comes on campus. Um, and, and it's interesting uh, to, to see their experiences relative to mine, which I don't necessarily remember a whole lot about the interview itself, other than I felt very unprepared for it. Um, so my hope here is to help you guys out there uh, be better prepared for your your uh, on-site interviews than I was. So that's my introduction. Thank you again, so thank much. You. Courtney could relate to so many things that you said. <laughs> All right, our next uh, uh, panelist is Jessica Huskin from uh, University of Utah. Jessica, please yeah. introduce. Uh, thanks for having me, Corinne. Um, so uh, I did my undergrad at MIT, which is actually where I, I met Corinne. She was uh, one of the postdocs in our lab uh, when I was just a, a baby undergrad as a, a, a junior, maybe a, a sophomore. Um, and um, I, I was super lucky to be at MIT as an undergrad. I'm, I'm originally from um, South Georgia. Uh, so I can turn my accent on when I need to, but my parents got real thick ones. It's my like party trick that I, I like to pull out. Um, and so it was a real stretch and a real dream for me to, to go to MIT. Um, and I was super lucky because they hired a ton of atmospheric chemists while I was there. Um, and I had known that I wanted to work in kind of the, the climate field for a while. I was one of those really strange sixth graders that did a science project. And my question was, what are the harmful effects of auto emissions and how can we prevent them? So as a sixth grader talking about nitrogen oxides and uh, now I'm a professor talking about nitrogen oxides. So I really had a full arc there, uh, which I think is pretty untypical. Um, but I got to MIT and I had done a lot of chemistry and they hired a bunch of atmospheric chemists. I realized I um, did not want to get oil out of the ground faster and be a chemical engineer like someone at the EPA had told me I should do if I wanted to, to work in the climate field. And so I ended up switching to Earth, Atmosphere, and Planetary Sciences, which is where Gaia is now. Um, so that was a, a fun um, piece of it. But um, I ended up going to the University of Washington for grad school with uh, Joel Thornton. And I at least saw we had one of his postdocs in the, uh, the group right now. So hi, Olga. Um, and I did my PhD there. I was co-advised between a modeling and a measurement group. Um, this was something I really intentionally did. I wrote my grad applications about wanting to kind of straddle um, that region, uh, just because I, I had seen a disconnect between people who can use models to, to validate them with data and people who actually collect data and have the expertise to know how to use it and what all it can be used for. 
Um, and so when I graduated from my living room in 2020 with my PhD via Zoom, um, I um, was lucky enough to go on to do a postdoc um, funded by the NSF um, AGS division. Um, and that lets you kind of select who you want to work with and where you go. And so it gives you a little bit of freedom. Um, and so I decided to circle back around to MIT. I had kept in contact with a lot of professors there and um, I ended up being in a different department. I was in civil and environmental engineering um, with Colette Heald for my postdoc. Um, and almost as soon as I got there, I started applying for faculty jobs. And I was super lucky because I had been on the ESWN uh, email list uh, when I was an undergrad. So I was savvy to a lot of their events and I got to do the path to professorship. Um, workshop that they had there. And so I was, I had a lot of resources to prep for my faculty interviews. Um, but I'm married um, to a woman and we had lived in Seattle and Massachusetts. And so we were really trying to find an area where we could feel comfortable living, um, just uh, social, soci socially um, and politically, uh, given the varying laws from state to state. Um, and we were looking for somewhere where we could afford to buy a house, um, quite frankly, uh, um, from a really poor area of Georgia, and my parents had never been able to buy a house. And so for me, having that financial stability was a really big, um, just like life goal of mine. Um, so we were really targeting um, faculty searches in areas we would be happy and comfortable living. So we had crossed California off. We had crossed Tennessee off. Uh, we had crossed Florida and Alabama off. So every time I saw a faculty listing, um, I would bring it to my wife and I would say, would you live here? <laughs> I would get a yes or a no. And so um, I saw this uh, faculty position pop up uh, in my email. I had done all the things to subscribe. I had like three people send it to me. Um, I saw one at Georgia Tech and I was super, super excited about that when I decided that was going to be the first position I applied for. And at this point, I was probably only eight months into my postdoc. Um, and I kind of heard that it takes a while to get an application to stick and that you don't want the first interview you go on to be your dream job. And so I said, you know, let's take my first year of my postdoc and let's just throw something at the wall, see if anything sticks, if I get lucky. But then next year, I'll really do it proper and I'll, you know, put a lot of time into it. So I threw my application out there from Georgia Tech and never heard back. And then um, a couple of days later, I had revamped it and ended up applying to this University of Utah job. Um, and I was really not sure about Utah. Um, it's a red state. Uh, they have a large religious plurality that's not particularly friendly to LGBTQ individuals. And I'd never been there before. And so I was not really sure if I would be comfortable living there long term. Um, and so uh, I threw my application out. I got a Zoom interview. Um, I thought it went OK. It was a little cold. Um, I had written down answers to questions I thought I might get um, and had just kind of um, I had done a little bit of research on the faculty. There were like 12 of them. I had figured out who was on the committee and kind of what they did and found out like one thing I could talk about with each of them with. And that really helped me out on my in-person interview for like driving around and, and having folks um, ask me random questions. I knew what I was going to talk about with that person. Um, but um, yeah, I went for, I did well in the Zoom interview, I guess. And um, I, I got an email from the search committee chair head who said, suddenly, I'm no longer the search committee chair head. I am the candidate advocate, which is this new sort of position that they have that says, hey, um, I'm not involved in the selection anymore. I'm here for you to ask all the questions everyone told you not to ask. And I was like, OK, this is a great position, but like you can't just go from being search committee chair head to being this person I'm supposed to trust. But, uh, you know, I, I took him at his word and he said, oh, is there, you know, I'd be happy to send a phone call before your interview. Um, and I was sitting there thinking, hmm, I don't know how many other people will say yes to this. So I'm going to go ahead and say yes. So I said yes, I set up a phone call. And he was just a treasure trove of information. He told me so much about the department and its plans and where it had been. And he had been committee head at one point. And so I was able to just like get a lot of info about the position before I showed up. And I really think that I might have been the only candidate that they invited in person that said yes to that. And he gave me a ton of great info. But he also, I, I expressed to him, uh, since he said he was candidate advocate, I said, hey, you know, my number one concern about this position is whether my wife and I will be comfortable moving and living to the state of Utah. Um, and that was a bit of a, a test for him to see how he would respond, um, because if they couldn't answer that question, then I didn't really want the job in the first place. And so I 
put it out there. And he actually ended up connecting me with the Dean of Admissions, um, who had just moved here. He is um, out and married and gay and about my age. And he's like, you know, I can't speak to that experience, but here I'd be happy to connect you with someone who can. Um, and so I got to enter, I got to chat with this guy via Zoom and just completely separate from the interview and um, being evaluated and stuff to just gauge a comfort level with what it was going to be like. And they ended up paying for an extra day for me to kind of stay on the weekend to see if I was comfortable there. And um, it was an all around great experience. And um, I had a, a great interview. I had a couple of hard questions. It's a weird situation because everyone in our department is tenured. And um, none of the women in the department, the two that were also hired there, were actually there for my interview. So in every conversation I had, I was the only woman who was senior, um, which was the first time I've ever been in that situation in my career. So that was kind of challenging. Um, but um, all in all, it went, it went really well. I got really excited during the interview for the position. Uh, and was really happy when I um, received the offer. Um, but it was basically the second job I applied for. So I didn't go through a super long process. I, I got quite lucky. Um, it ended up being a great research match. Um, so yeah, but that's uh, that's kind of my journey. I ended up starting um, in January. So I'm three months into the job. Um, so I'm brand new. Um, but yeah, that's how I got here. <laughs> Which is great perspective that, you know, we're, we're hearing from different perspective of someone who's been in a job uh, for a very short time and someone who's more experienced, which is exactly what we want. All right. Thank you, Jessica. So happy to see you here. We're, we're really closing a circle here, the two of us. Our next panelist is Rachel uh, Bernard. Rachel, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Rachel Bernard. I'm an assistant professor at Amherst College in Western Massachusetts. It's a small liberal arts college with only undergraduate students. Um, and uh, I'm a structural geologist, so I study, or kind of, so I study how the mantle deforms uh, and lower crust. Um, hmm, okay, so I kind of went my entire PhD um, actively, or, you know, knowing that I had no interest in academia and feeling very good about that. Um, and so it it wasn't until, because um, I'm I, more interested in teaching and, and outreach. And so I thought I wanted to go in a more museum or kind of informal science education path. Um, but then at, at some point, maybe close to the end of my fourth year, my PhD, I met um, some people who taught at um, like not an R1, but a um, like a comprehensive state school. It, it's basically a, a public college. So um, a school that is publicly funded, but doesn't have graduate students. And they kind of told me about what they do for their jobs and how you know, they do a little bit of research, but get to do a lot of outreach and whatever they want to do is supported by their department. And so I thought that sounded cool. Um, so I started thinking about academia. Um, meanwhile, my husband is um, was doing his PhD in economics. Um, and in the economics as a discipline, everyone's going to be really jealous, but it's very uh, centralized. So they go through this job hiring process where there's one website where all the jobs get posted for new PhDs, newly, you know, about to finish PhD students. And so industry, government, and um, academic jobs for kind of new PhD students get put on this one website and they do all of their interviews. So we had, you know, you do your first round interviews at their version of AGU, so their big scientific conference. And so we did maybe 30 first round interviews and then a bunch of flyouts, And so he did that, he was doing his thing. I had already accepted a postdoc um, to go to Scripps in uh, University of San Diego um, or UC San Diego. Um, and so he, we were visiting Cleveland because he got a, an offer from the Cleveland Federal Reserve. And so I went with them to check Cleveland out in, I don't know, February wasn't great. It's kind of sad. And then when we were there, um, he got a call that he was going to be offered a position at Amherst College. And so when he got that call, that's when, so I know like some people asked about um, when to bring up spousal hires in the 
kind of hiring process. So this is when you do it. <laughs> so he got an offer. And as soon as he got this offer, he's like, okay, I'm married and she wants a job too. And then so um, Amherst College being a very small college, the econ and the geology people know each other and are friends. And I didn't realize that at the time. I didn't know anything at the time. Um, but they everything kind of kicked into high gear and the econ department connected with geology geology scrambled, made a um, kind of a schedule for me to interview. And so we had to go straight from Cleveland to Amherst and kind of backing up. The reason why I mentioned this whole centralized process in economics was that he got an offer on a Tuesday and he had until Sunday to make his decision. Um, so it's very, because it's centralized, everyone's getting offers all at once. And so you can't just like sit around thinking about it or else they'll lose all of the other backup candidates. So we had to go straight to Cleveland, to Amherst. I got a interview wardrobe at Target, um, the Target that I go to every day now, um, and kind of was thrust into like interview mode. I had no application materials because I had already, you know, still a PhD student, had my postdoc lined up. So I was like, eh, I'll do that at some point in the future. And so had to like, and they wanted... So this is like kind of next day they wanted, I met with all these people. They wanted my teaching statement, research statement. Um, they wanted an idea of my, um, well, I'll get to that later. But anyway, so I had to write all these things basically in one day just to get them something. Um, and so I met with people and I didn't really understand what was going on because no one was ever like, this is an interview for a job. So I knew, you know, a part of me was like, maybe they're just like humoring me or humoring Neil and like, you know, sure, we'll meet his wife and see what's up. Um, but so during the, so uh, yeah, so I met with the geology department, then I met with the provost who at Amherst, it's like, like the vice president of the college. And she asked me like about my startup costs and all this stuff. So I was like, oh, I'll have to get back to you on that. So I had to like call a bunch of people, like people that I that are in my department at UT and be like, how does it, how much did your microscope cost help? Like how much does lab, do lab supplies cost and kind of whip up something. And anyway, in the end, I ended up with a three-year visiting um, position, which now I know is like pretty, pretty typical for what they give um, spousal hires if there's a need in the department. Um, so it's pretty lucky. And then um I can put that, answer the chat um, in a second. I'll ask my husband for that website. Um, but um, yeah, so I, um, so fast forward, you know, I, maybe in my second year, I started to get interest a little bit from other departments that are like, oh, are you looking for, we see you're your visitor. Are you going to be applying for jobs? And I was told as a visitor, the only way to kind of transfer to be go from a visitor to a tenure track was to basically to get an outside offer like that's how you have to do it like you have to push the issue like the only way to like force this issue like force the provost to be like yes we can do this is to like put pressure on it so I so in early 2021 20, in my second year I started interviewing for I interviewed for other um, jobs and got two offers and then went through a negotiation and went through like, you know, I, I actually was considering these other places. They're like really good schools. And so trying to work with them to see if my husband who's like, if he could be the spouse and doing all these negotiations. And in the end, we um, stayed at um, Amherst. So that, so I've been, so this is my, about to be the end of my second tenure track year. So, Thank you, yep, Rachel. <laughs> that is definitely a, a, a different experience. And we're so happy to have you here because you can share your experience, even though you had to go through the regular interview with other universities. Mm -hmm. Our last panelist is uh, Gaia Stuckwa. Gaia, I'm so sorry, I'm murdering your last name. Can you please introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Gaia Stucky de Quay, but it's French, so you can pronounce it however you want. Doesn't matter. Or you can just not say it. I just avoid saying my last name as much as possible. Um, yeah, so I am an assistant professor here at EAPS, uh, 
Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences um, at MIT. I just started in January as well. So um, kind of like Jessica, the process is still a bit fresh and we're still learning the consequences of all the things we've done and decided on and been awarded. So, um, but yeah, it's really fun to see it all from different perspectives, different timelines and coming in from different backgrounds. So hopefully I can also add some um, more information to that. But I guess, so I, I come from a bit further away. So I did my undergrad at the University College of London. Originally I'm from Portugal, Brazil, and Spain, but I did all my school in English. So always wanted to end up in an English speaking country. Um, so I was in London, but when I was in London, I had an exchange program in the US at UT Austin when I was about 19 or 20. And that's kind of when I fell in love with America and just, you know, American culture and the way people do science here and planetary science in particular, which is so big and so well-funded and exciting. And you have NASA and, you know, especially in Texas, and it was super exciting for me. And that was a short stint. And so I came back to London and that's when I had to start applying for grad school. And so I applied to all my grad school in the U.S. to do planetary things. And I was super excited about it. Um, got rejected from every single program. So I <laughs> didn't get it, um, which, you know, meant that I ended up staying in London, still a good university. So I went to Imperial College London. So, um, you know, not complaining at all. And I had a great graduate program as well, just not planetary and not U.S. So I was still kind of far away from the path that I had originally wanted. But that's just to say that, you know, I mean, I am here now, as you can see, fast forward. So just because you don't get the right program or the right position, whether it's graduate um, or postdoc or even tenure track, you can always hop on later on if another opportunity comes up and they come up all the time. And so luckily, you know, I aired these frustrations to my advisor, who was also really kind. Even after the first year, I was like, I want to quit grad school. This is not what I want to do. And he was like, what, like, what do you want? Like, and I was like, I want to be in America and I want to do planetary science. And he's like, okay, like, we'll just keep our eye open for like opportunities outside. Like, we'll try and do a project together. You know, just, we'll just, we'll make it work. And we did. And so I ended up coming to the U.S. Uh, for like a visiting studentship in the University of Chicago. That's when I did my first like planetary project working on Mars. Um, and that was super exciting. And those things are more important because that's when they really expand your network. So that's when I first got to meet uh, planetary people, come to conferences and actually find out, you know, where to go for summer schools and workshops and who to email and who are the PIs that do what I do. And so that was really good to open up my horizon a bit. And then when it came time to apply for postdocs, I knew much more than I did back then. And so I was able to reach out to the right people and go to the right places to ask for postdocs. And even then I was still unemployed for a few months between grad school and postdoc. So it still wasn't perfect. And there were still, you know, some hiccups along the way, but eventually ended, ended up in America back at UT Austin, where I originally had gone to for my exchange program. And so that was fun to go full circle. And so there I was in um, uh, the planetary surface processes group led by Tim Gouge. And that was a lot of fun. I was his very first hire. So I got to see for the first time how someone actually builds a lab. So like I was just there on my own. He was even on parental leave. So I was just kind of there in like an empty lab and, you know, helping him sometimes order things and like talking to the new students he was going to admit. And so that was kind of my first taste of like, oh, what would it be like to like be a professor actually, uh, when before it was something that I hadn't really considered. I just liked research and I kept doing it and I hadn't really considered like an academic like track forever kind of thing. Um, so that was a lot of fun and I really enjoyed that postdoc. It, after about a year, a year and a half, it started to get towards the end. You know, postdocs are only like one or two years. And for me especially, it's kind of tough because for those of you who are on J-1 visas or similar, you really need to get another postdoc or position that perfectly lines up with your end date with the other one. Because if there's even a one day gap, you have to leave the U.S. and you can't come back for five years for another J-1. Um, so if you miss, yeah, if you miss that gap, then you just can't come back. And so I really needed another position after my postdoc. And that could be a postdoc or it could be maybe a faculty position because now I was learning to be more independent. I was writing proposals, helping to advise students. So I thought, you know, maybe this, maybe I could do it. 
but I still remember kind of similar to, to Courtney, someone had asked me, you know, also oh, like, what is your end goal? Is it to be a professor? And I remember even a year before applying, I was like, ew, no, <laughs> it was not at all on my radar, but it just depends on your role models. And after being in that group and seeing how well, how happy the students were, how good the group was, how like successful and kind and, you know, great it can be. It just completely changes your mindset on what a, a job even is. And so by the end of the year, when the application cycle starts, which is usually usually in the fall, so from September, you have to keep an eye out, started building that massive Google sheet from zero. So like, um, you know, rows with everything that can matter between, you know, where it is geographically, how much they pay, if you can even find out all of that. And I even, uh, Jessica was talking about showing the job ad to her partner and saying, would you like to live here? I actually had columns rating what I thought of this place from one to 10 and what my partner thought of it from one to 10. And then we had an average column from one to 10. <laughs> so it was like the average column that we looked at. Um, and so, yeah, populating that Google sheet with any opportunity I could find because I was really desperate. I wasn't discriminating between liberal arts colleges, R2, R1. It was just literally anything that we both would like to live in that was in America and that would hire me in terms of what field, because sometimes it's not a broad search, it's a very targeted search for planetary or, or whatever you're doing. Um, and so, yeah, I ended up applying to, I think about 10 faculty jobs and 15 postdocs all at the same time. Again, huge range of what they were because I, I really just wanted anything. And so throughout that application cycle, I started having some interviews and it was kind of with the interviews that I started learning what I would like and what I wouldn't like. And so I remember my first interview was a liberal arts college interview. And they asked me so much about teaching and students and I just had no idea. And so I was just like, maybe this isn't for me right now because I don't know what I'm doing with teaching. I've only done research. I'm not even excited about the prospect of teaching. So maybe I, well, I ended up withdrawing from that one and then um, just going more for the, the research focused ones, at least for now when I didn't have as much experience and was kind of intimidated by all the teaching. And so, yeah, uh, I was lucky enough that the one that I was most excited about, which is the MIT job, even though I had asked my advisor, like I told him, I shouldn't apply for this, right? Like it's completely out of my league. And he was like, no, you applied to everything. Nothing is ever outside of your league. You lose nothing from applying, especially faculty packages because they're so standardized. Postdocs, you can like have, maybe sometimes it's a five page proposal, two page proposal. Sometimes it's a statement. It can be really different, but faculty packages are so standardized that if you're like good at it and if you've done it a few times, you can change one faculty package into one for another university within a couple of hours, just change names, do a bit of research and you can really apply to as many as you want without wasting too much time. Um, and so I did it and uh, it was the first kind of like preliminary interview that I did. It was a lot of fun and maybe a bit untraditional because they gave me the questions they were going to ask before because they really wanted you to like prepare as much as possible. And so there were five questions, the standard questions like, you know, what have you, what were your biggest achievements so far? What is your plan for your research group? Um, diversity questions. So all of those pretty standard questions you get. And so you get a chance to prepare really well because now you know exactly what, what they're going to ask. And so you get like the perfect questions lined up and the slides and everything and you time it perfectly. And then that went really well. And then another thing that was really untypical that they did was that the, the head of the search committee was kind of like my mentor, like all of, he was a mentor to all of the candidates. And so he would actually meet with me frequently to be like, you know, how's it going? Like, did you remember to do this? Like, just remember that these are the five most important things. You need to show leadership and you can do that by doing this. You need to show um, independence and you can do this, like, like literally guiding us through the process. And his reason for that, what he was saying is that he wants 
every candidate to be the best version of themselves. And he wants to make the decision as hard as possible for them. So if it's incredibly hard, then they've done a good job. If it's an easy decision, then they haven't done a good job, basically. And so I really enjoyed that. And the whole process was really smooth and easy. And when it came around to the job talk, um, again, it was a bit non-typical, but for a different reason. So this was during COVID. So all of my job talk interviews, campus visits were all through Zoom. Um, which is a bit hard because you don't get a feel for the department, you don't get a feel for the people, the students, you know, maybe they're not as honest if they're like in a Zoom chat or not. I don't I don't really know how it works, but that whole like feeling the atmosphere of a campus and visiting the city didn't exist for me, which was tough, especially when you have to make a decision and you still can't travel because it was a whole, you know, year and a half where you couldn't travel. Um, but, you know, in the end, you you should have all the information you need, because in the end, you know, a lot of things that matter is what is the university giving to you? Are they giving you enough for you to do your science and for you to be happy? And um, I decided that they did. And so I got the MIT offer. I got another offer, which is really great if you get more than one offer, even if it's just two, because you can kind of like counter um use the offers against each other to, to bump that up. But essentially the interview process was really positive and that's what really helped me decide because it was just filled with kind people that were kind of like mentoring you through the process. But it's very, very committee dependent because within the same department, within the same university, a different committee can have a completely different method, different questions, different approach, different timelines. So definitely don't um, focus too much on that because it can really change. But I think that was it for that. Um, the other main thing is that, yeah, well, it was the first job talk that I did, but one of the main things that we'll also talk about now, which is about preparing, is that if you know it's an important job and that you really want it, then I mean, I ended up spending full time preparing for this interview because I really wanted it. it. I was not doing any research, any advising, nothing. I would wake up at 8 a.m. during COVID and work until 8 p.m. to make like the perfect presentation. I, like Jessica said, I read about every single person I thought I would meet, read like at least one paper for each person so I would have something to talk about. And these are all things that if you really want to get this job, then that's like the minimum you need to do. Um, yeah. Um, and I think that's it. And I'm, yeah, I'm really excited to be here and I'm really excited to hear about some of the questions you may have for all of us. All right. Well, thank you so much, Gaia. First of all, thank all, all of you who register for the event, who send us questions. We were able to collect uh, and get a lot of questions. We try to create some common ground and common team. And this is basically what we're going to do now. Um, uh, we don't have tons of time and we want to be mindful and make sure you're going to have some time to interact with each of our panelists. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists to answer quickly. We prepared several questions for you. Rimat will put them in the chat, uh, uh, each of the question. And um, you will have time to ask question later on. So don't forget that. We're going to go into our first question. We're going to have Courtney and Rachel answer this question. What should you expect? in this interview process? Some of you already mentioned that. What should you expect, Courtney? Um, well, from the perspective of interviews at a liberal arts, predominantly teaching college or university, um, expectations might be a little different than an R1, right? Um, you might be asked to give a research seminar or a teaching demonstration or some combination of the two where you can teach um, something that's related to your research to help uh, your audience kind of understand what it is that you're doing because you will be talking to a much broader um, range of, of people um, with lots of different backgrounds and disciplinary backgrounds. Um, in terms of expectations, I, I, again, I didn't really know what to expect, um, but really you should expect to meet with everybody who has any kind of decision-making authority in the, in the um, process. Um, so that's gonna include everybody on the committee. 
um, and who's on the committee also matters, right? So um, at least at, at Hendrix, there's always um, the majority of the department is on the committee. There's one person from within the natural sciences area um, that's not in the department that's on the committee. There's always someone who is in from other areas across campus that's uh, also on the committee. So you're gonna have two people who aren't in the department. Um, you're also hopefully going to have students on that committee uh, and you're gonna get an opportunity to really interact with those students um, and get a taste for the type of students that that, that institution has. Um, other decision-making people uh, that you will probably meet with are, um, uh, we call it at Hendricks, the Committee on Faculty. So that's the, the group of people who um, the search committee sends their recommendation to. Um, they've all met with the candidates and so that they either you know, validate that recommendation and it goes on to the president and on up the chain. And so you could meet with the provost, you could meet with the president of the college. Um, all of those people should be on your schedule. Um, you should also have meetings with people who aren't in that decision making process. So you should have an opportunity to talk to human resources. Um, and that's where you get to ask the questions about, you know, uh, benefits packages and um, salaries and that kind of thing. Um, so you should have a range of different types of people that you'll be meeting with. Um, and, and ever ever since you get off the plane, um, that interview starts. Uh, it's gonna be a long day <laughs> or two or three. And so keeping your well-being in mind and um, pack yourself some snacks um, and some uh, a, a bottle of water to take everywhere with you um, to just to help keep you going. So in terms of who you're gonna meet, that gives you an idea um, of how to frame your questions because you should have uh, different types of questions for different uh, people that you meet along the way. Um, you should also, because we're post COVID and most of these interviews are in person on campus, um, you should be able to walk around campus and see what campus culture looks like. Um, you should get a tour of the city or town um, so you have an idea of what the broader community looks like. And um, so, so that gives you some kind of glimpse into kind of the lifestyle that uh, you might be living in that um, within that community uh, or whether or not that community is a good fit for you, right? Um, you, you should also expect to, it's not just about being able to sell yourself to them, but they should be able to sell themselves to you. It's kind of like dating. Um, you want to make sure that um, it's the right place for you, the same as they want to make sure it's the right place, the, the, you're the right person for them. Um, and, and in that way, there's not a whole lot you can prepare for beyond you know, doing the research, knowing the people that you're going to meet, uh, figuring out who to ask what questions those kinds of things, but um, you should expect to have a full day of back-to-back -back meetings. They will feed you, hopefully, but um, the times in between, uh, make sure that you advocate for when you need a break. Uh, so uh, that's a little bit different than probably what you would experience at, at a, a bigger school. Um, I think one of the most important parts at uh, applying for an academic position at a predominantly teaching institution is that interaction with the students. Um, if that goes well, you know, it's great because the students can be your advocates. If it doesn't go well, and if you don't show any interest in the students and their interests and, you know, what their career aspirations are, then um, they can also break that, um, that offer too. So I think at, at a place like Hendrix, the interactions with the students is just as important as interactions with faculty. Thank you, Courtney. That was a very long and detailed uh, uh, answer to the question. Rachel, would you have anything to add from your experience to this preparation aspect? To sorry, to what to expect? 
Um, I think Courtney covered um, most, a lot of it. Um, yeah, I would just echo that. Yeah, at a teaching, um, call or a teaching college undergrad institution, you'll probably will be expected to do a lecture, um, of some sort or a class. You know, it doesn't have to be a traditional lecture style. I think a lot of places would love to see more, um, like active learning teaching. They want to see what your teaching style is. Um, sometimes that from what I've heard from other people that have interviewed, you know, at other schools, you know, sometimes you're given a topic, um, you know, it's like lecture on, you know, some, this specific topic for an intro class. Sometimes it's up to you to pick the topic or the class. Um, and, you know, students and faculty might sit in on that, um, and kind of attend that class. And then you'd also do usually like a, a research talk, a seminar, um, and yeah, like I think but both at um R ones and at smaller um schools, you'll probably have like informal lunches with students um where you talk to them, they meet you. And I remember at, at UT, we that's where I went to grad school, we would um I was a student member of one of the search committees. So all the search committees would have a, a grad student member. So I got a good view of the process from that end. Um, and so the candidates would, you know, meet with individuals in the department, several people, and then at, usually at one point, they would meet with the committee um, as a whole. Um, and at that, at least I, you actually, at a lot of places, they tend to like have very specific questions. That they're asking all of the candidates, like they come up with a list of questions, and they ask the same ones to everyone. Um, I would also say that you know, hopefully there'll be a there'll be a point person, like a faculty member that's in either the chair of the search committee or someone else that's kind of the point person for you. And I know that um <clears throat> they're a resource for like if you have a question on, you know, what level of research should I be presenting, you know, how much of this job talk um should include, you know, DEI stuff versus research stuff. So like all of those questions, if you have questions about like the scope or concerns about your schedule, like, um, you know, like let's say you are breastfeeding or, or need to take a medication at certain times just to let the person that's making your schedule know, like I need, you know, a certain amount of breaks during the day. Um, so yeah, usually there's one point person who you should be able to ask questions with. And then um, like at Amherst and I think at other schools, yeah, as Courtney said, you're gonna meet with people that are often outside of the department, like either if it's like the dean of some college, or in my case, it was meeting with the provost, um, some higher up person um, typically meets with all the candidates too. Um, and so you should be prepared to explain your research to someone who has never taken a geology class before, but is also highly educated. Um, and uh, and ha yeah, yeah, I'll stop there because I know there's more questions. All right. Um, thank you, Rachel. Gaia, I know you mentioned it already as part of, of your introduction. Can you talk in short how to prepare best for the interview? Sure. I would say there's three things you want to focus on. Um, and I have either a Google Doc or a slideshow or something always associated to those because you always want to like populate these things with all your thoughts and all your ideas. The first one is that I mentioned briefly, and again, Jessica mentioned briefly, you should find out who you're gonna speak to in the department, or sometimes they give you the schedule like the day before you visit. So you have to try and guess who you're gonna be talking to. They're sometimes not as organized as you want. So, you know, if you're in a department with 120 faculty, it's tougher, but basically make a list of all the people you're likely to meet, you know, put a picture in a Word document, name, what do they do, go to their Google Scholar, what's their most cited thing, which is basically probably their baby that they're most proud of, what's their most recent thing, that's probably what they're working on right now and they're really excited about, just try and find out as much, just this is where you get to go like stalker mode on people, <laughs> um, which is, it's fine, I mean, it's all on the internet, so I mean, it's, it's all available. Um, and just find out as much as you want about these people, because in the end, these are your colleagues. Your colleagues are choosing their next colleague. And so 
you want to be excited about them and they want to be excited about you. It's not like a normal company job where it's HR who decides these things. It's basically colleagues choosing colleagues. And if you're not excited about your colleagues, they're not going to be excited about you. So you kind of want to find also connections, not just their work, but like, oh, they published a cool thing in this mangrove in this place. And I just did some field work there. I really want to ask them about this, write down that question and they'll be super happy to talk about it. So just find links, find their most recent work, find their most famous work. And then I think that should cover all the bases. And that's one. The second one is like collect all the common questions for interview, because even though you probably did the first initial interview, they're probably still going to throw in some like curveballs and some like standard questions like, oh, it's, you know, like even in normal conversation, wh where do you expect to get most of your funding? And you might think like it's just colleagues chatting with colleagues, but no, it's kind of an undercover question. And so you want to be able to throw out like a structured question. You don't want to memorize an entire answer to these things. But again, I had a whole Google document, which was the most common questions or every single question I've ever been asked or any of my friends have ever been asked. And funding source will be one of those questions. And I'll have memorized bullet points of like, oh, like, yeah, there's this NASA CDA program. There's this NASA LDA program. There's the NSF program. There's this one. There's these field work ones. And you want to be able to just throw those out without any hesitation to show that you thought about it. There's nothing you haven't thought about. Um, yes. And then the third one, which is arguably one of the most important ones, which is your job talk. And your job talk, again, is going to be, you know, your presentation. It's going to be how you present yourself to this department. And the trick to that is that you don't create your job talk alone. You like It kind of takes a village to make the perfect job talk. And so your first draft will be so bad, but you show your first draft to, <laughs> you show it to your advisor and you throw stuff in, you show it to your group meeting, they throw more stuff in, you show it to your partner and he tells you your posture is weird and you say like too many times. And so all of these iterations will turn it into something that is terrible that a kindergartner could have done to something that you know you could actually be proud of and excited to present and comfortable because the more you do it the more comfortable you are and so i would say those are the three main things that you want to focus on thank you kaya rachel anything to add to that yeah really quickly i was just going to say um thinking about things to prepare some things that you might not expect from my own experience is like have an idea you know i think you don't necessarily need a full number uh, or a specific number for your like startup costs, but I it, it someone might ask what kind of resources would you like? They want a ballpark. It's like, do you need to build an entire geochronology lab, like, or do you, you know, are your research needs more modest? Like the kind of um, startup like ballpark number that you might. Um, need to be successful like they'll probably want to know that um and then so i would have a sense of that in your mind um so what do you need um and then um also what to prepare um i don't know i'll 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 leave it so we can move on to other questions all right, we're moving to the next, the third question. What to ask, not to ask. Do you ask about expected salary, benefit? We already heard some of the answer uh, from the from our panelists. Um, what are things you would bring out? Courtney, we will start with you, but I'm gonna ask again, please all of our panelists try to keep it short. We wanna have we wanna be sure to go through all the questions and also at least get one QA question from our audience because we they're already coming in. Courtney. Yeah, um, I, I think we have touched on some of this already. Um, my one brief piece of advice is to know who to ask what. Um, you know, if you're going to be meeting with the committee that goes through faculty evaluations and tenure and promotion, ask them what the tenure and promotion process looks like. What does cyclical evaluations for faculty look like? What do annual reviews look like? Um, that's where you ask those kinds of questions. Um, and, and, and if you wanna know more about the departmental culture, ask someone in the department, how do you make decisions in department meetings, right? Um, those kinds of things. So I think it's, it's really about asking who, asking what questions for specific people that you're gonna be meeting rather than what to ask and what not to ask. Um, 
in, in general, you shy away from um, salary and benefits and, you know, where do you live and that kind of thing. Um, keep those to your, your HR meeting um, unless, um, unless you want to ask, I think there is that opportunity as well. So if you feel comfortable asking those more personal questions, but in general, you have a chance to talk to someone about that, that um, is on your list. Thank you. Gaia, would you like to add anything to that question? Um, I think Courtney said it all. I, I would just add that the moment you get offered that job, the power dynamic is going to completely flip and then you can literally ask any question you want. So don't worry if you don't feel comfortable asking or if you're scared, just wait and then you can find out all the dirty little secrets. So it'll be fine. <laughs> I agree. Uh, Jessica, our next question will be to you. And you mentioned part of the part of it in, in when you introduce yourself. What are your strategies for dealing with difficult questions during the interview? How much should you disclose? Should you disclose? What are you doing with questions that they're not supposed to ask? Yeah, so I had um, quite the experience with this. Um, I was in, um, during my in-person interview, I was completely meeting with men the whole time. Um, and at least after my job talk, which went phenomenally, I think my job talk, I remember the exact moment I got the job. Um, I knew that my audience was a lot more atmospheric scientists who focused on meteorology topics. Um, and that I was the only real chemist in the room doing any atmospheric chemistry work. And so um, I had luckily all my degrees were in atmospheric sciences um, and the chat that I had before my interview, the guy had told me that their chief concern with me, and this was again, why getting that beforehand information was so useful, um, that their chief concern with me that um, I wasn't enough of an atmospheric scientist to be in an atmospheric sciences department, which is hilarious because my, all my degrees are in atmospheric sciences. Um, so I knew that I needed to connect my chemistry to the core of atmospheric sciences there. And there was a moment where I connected this concept of sea star, which is like um, relative humidity, but for other gases, to the concept of relative humidity. And I saw all the faculty members just look around at each other. Um, so I think that was the moment I got the, the job. Uh, I, I remember it very clearly. But after that, they took me to a room where they asked me a lot of hard questions. And they're not chemists. A couple of them knew just enough to get confused. And at least one of the members was giving me some kind of hostile questions. And so I went into, it wasn't really hostile as much as like, he was very clearly trying to test me and trying to poke holes in. But because they were all distinctly older than me, the whole department has tenure. I'm 20 years younger than the next faculty member. Um, so it was a real power dynamic that I, I hadn't really been super familiar with. Um, but I'm from the South. Uh, I got a lot of Southern charm and sort of my strategy going in for dealing with hostile questions was to be number one, inquisitive. Um, I wanted to show that I was eager uh, to answer, that I wanted to be friendly um, and kind of turn that hostility back around if I could to, to just kind of get it back into this, oh, that's a really interesting question. You know, I hadn't thought about that before. Oh, man, that that gives me some really good ideas. You're right. That's a great question, Tim. I can't wait to look into that more. You know, those types of ways to kind of take away that hostility. I think if you can combat it with friendliness and eagerness and as a young person interviewing, if you can, you really want to show that you are willing to learn from the other faculty that you don't know at all. I think the biggest, this is the next question I have, which is the common mistake that people make is it's women. But I think the common thing that young people will do is say, I have everything figured out and this is how I will do it and I will be taking no advice. Uh, you're young, they have been teaching for years. They know they have more experience and you, like even if it's a totally different field, you want to make them feel that way. Um, so my technique for, for dealing with the hostile questions was just to, to be friendly and turn it back around on it. Another technique that I had because I was really curious about, um, I wanted to work with DEI, EDI students, diverse students. I wanted to have a diverse research group. I wanted to be in a department where if I brought um, an EDI initiative to them, that they were going to be enthusiastic about implementing it. Um, and I wanted to be somewhere that I could be impactful and make a change and that I wasn't going to be just like hammered on, like, no, we're not going to do that the whole time. That was just not going to be a good fit for me and what I wanted to do in terms of service um, and getting, you know, tenure. And so my strategy kind of came from 
Um, one of the questions that they asked uh, for the DEI and diversity statements was um, uh, sort of like, what will you do to improve diversity if we hire you? And so I had decided that my technique for getting the info I wanted about how comfortable this environment was going to be for me as, as a gay woman was to turn that around and on them and ask them that question. So I had a technique of just saying, well, what is the department already doing? Like, where are you guys in your journey to increase diversity and sort of how, um, and especially when I was meeting with the younger faculty members who I knew were a little bit more involved with the EDI service things, or if they had mentioned they were on that committee for the deed or something, I would ask them, I'd say, well, well how, um, how do these uh, EDI discussions go in the department? Um, I was really forward when I was meeting with students about asking them to introduce their pronouns. And it was amazing because uh, during this lunch meeting with uh, undergrads, I had asked everyone to introduce themselves with names and pronouns and they went around and about five minutes into that we were still going around and a trans student walked in and um, was just sitting there and uh, they got to it got to them and they were like, this is the first time I've ever been asked for my pronouns in a meeting and I was like. I didn't like read when I walked into the room and asked people to do this. This was going to be, be be like part of it. It's just something that that I feel strongly about, and it meant so much to that student. And I was just like, "Wow, okay, this this makes a little difference here or there." Um, so yeah, in terms of um, how much should you disclose, you should disclose what you feel comfortable. I disclosed more about my marital status and my concerns about moving to Utah because I wanted to hear their answers. Um, uh, but I think that's a personal decision um, that you have to make um, in, in your situation. Um, but really, I, I mean, you don't want a position that you're not comfortable in. So you should be asking the questions to get that information that you need during your interview as well. Thank you, Jessica. You already touched some of the aspect of the fifth question, which are common, uh, what are common mistakes women make during this interview? Is there anything else you would like to add other than what you mentioned? Sure. Um, I'll add that women especially tend to look younger than men when applying for jobs. Um, and uh, one thing that you can do is underdress, uh, make sure you look nice. Um, and I, um, especially if you're not in the gender binary, it can be a little challenging to figure out what you feel comfortable in. Um, but there are a lot of style guides out there. There's a lot of kids doing YouTubes for how to dress professionally um, and where to find cheap clothes on a grad salary. And you can do all those things regardless of sort of where you like to dress on the gender spectrum. Um, so, yeah, I would say dress nicely. Um, I would say that um, women especially might tend to um, over disclose some personal information during interviews. You, you mentioned something once, like it's generally enough to, to do um, comfy shoes, big one. For sure. Uh, great shout out, Rachel. Um, but that, that's really all I have to add. I mean, you're branding yourself on your interview. And I think that we could steal a lot from business school students who send out. Um, I've gotten uh, from my MIT uh, consultant friends who work at McKinsey. They'll send out like polls to their friends to be like, what is my personal brand? Uh, do I dress professionally? Am I known to be a friendly person? Am I a little hostile? Uh, you're building your personal brand when you go on this interview. So if you give a good job talk, then you're known for being a good science communicator. Um, and those pieces kind of all add up to their impression of you. So if you can curate what it is you want to present, then you can put that into your interview. Um, so. All right. And our last question, which I'm really going to ask each each one of you to just mention in a quick sentence, do you have any tips how to pass a successful interview? Who wants to go first? I'll go first. I'm on a roll. Uh, <laughs> uh, my tips are to be energetic, uh, be friendly, um, and be, uh, be someone who's going to bring energy to the department. A lot of places that are looking for a new hire are trying to find someone who's going to bring something they don't have. And a lot of, uh, especially when they're looking to hire assistant professors, they're looking for someone who's going to bring new ideas, new energy um, to the department and someone that students like working with. So your personability is almost just as important as your research and your teaching and your qualifications. And it just kind of all comes together into this holistic picture. They're looking for the whole candidate. They're not looking for someone who just has strong research. And so your personability during your interview goes a long way. Thank you, Jessica. Anyone else would like to answer that question? Gaia. I can add to Jessica just, and also what I said before, this is colleagues hiring colleagues. 
And these colleagues will all have a vote. So they're all gonna decide after you leave, after you've had your three, four, two, one days there, they're all gonna have a vote. So, and every vote counts, right? So don't ignore one person or not read about this other person or just say, oh, I did a lot for this person, that one, more for that one, or I'll just focus on my job uh, talk. Every aspect counts and every person or every faculty member will get a vote usually. And so you really want to tie up all those loose ends and try and integrate yourself. I mean, at the end, that's what you want to do. You want to integrate yourself in the department and make them want to have you there for seven plus years. Or more. Oh. Courtney, Rachel, any one of you would like to add? Sure. Um, I think the best piece of advice I can give based on all the, the interviews I've sat in is to go in with a growth mindset and you're not going to know everything before you arrive. You're going to learn about the institution as you're going through the interview process, through the questions that they ask you, through the answers that they give you to your questions. And you may have different answers to their questions later in the interview process than you do at the beginning. And that's actually showing that you're learning about them and that you're growing through that interview process and that you're listening to them. And I think that's a really important piece of advice to hear. Thank you. Rachel, anything to add? Yeah, I would just um, like one thing would be to, um, you know, think about, think about, yeah, how you're going to, so I'll, Courtney's mention of growth reminded me of this. Think about how your research might evolve because everyone, you know, we have like for me, for example, um, you know, my research, I think, can come across as a bit narrow um, at the beginning. You know, I like studying my mantle microstructures, but think about ways that especially at a small college thing, different areas where your research can branch out into that maybe you haven't done yet but that you've either dabbled in or planned to go. Like, so mine was, you know, during my postdoc, I got to look at a bit of olivine rich meteorites. Like that's not my background, but it's like somewhere where I could definitely see growing and um, changing directions as a researcher. And I think that could also help like thinking back at my, in my experience sitting in on like that one search at UT, um, there were a few people that got dinged a little bit because their research overlapped too much with people that were already there. And so if you can, you know, position yourself as being as broad as possible, you're less likely to have that. It's like, okay, well, we don't need another professor so-and-so. We don't need another like basin guy. We already have one of those. So like, you know, play up um, different areas you can evolve um, like as your research goes forward. Very good perspective. 